a discussion around innovating the future. And I'll be very pleased to be handing over the stage to Bloomberg's uh, Nitin Jaiswal here from Singapore. See you in a moment. Can take a seat there. Hi, Dror. So we had a very interesting discussion in the morning. So let me give a context before we get the conversation started. Uh, when you look at what happened in the financial markets, uh, in terms of digitization of the financial markets, it was not led largely by the large corporation financial institutions. It was largely led by the disruption which was brought about by the startups and the technology players. Right. They forced the large corporations to take action. If they have been left on their own, I don't think we would have seen a financial revolution what we have seen this time. So when we look at the climate, we see the same thing. Large corporations are still reluctant to go all out in terms of creating the disruption uh, so that they can solve the climate problem. Again. The way we had fintech, I think we will hear about the concept of climate tech more often going forward. But when we look at the concept of climate tech, it is a very broad spectrum. It has too many layers in it. So from your experience, can you please share how do you define climate tech? What are the things included in that? Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, <clears throat> so climate tech for me is like an umbrella name for uh, many things. Uh, actually. Unlike what uh, many people uh, think about, uh, you know, we used to call it the clean tech, which basically uh, was energy solutions. And uh, today we think that climate tech is uh, just, uh, I don't know, removing carbon from the atmosphere. Well, we use a different uh, definition. It's actually any technology, uh, no matter in which uh, sector, which is either mitigating climate change or adapting to it, meaning any technology that is uh, reducing emissions, this is mitigation or any technology that is helping humanity to adapt to a warmer uh, planet. It can be in uh, food, agriculture, water, uh, energy, transportation, industry, whatever human activity which is uh, uh, emitting gases to the atmosphere. And I agree with you, and it in, uh, it's a complete uh, change of uh, paradigm. Uh, most of the very significant part of innovation in the last uh, decade or two were driven by software-based solutions, uh, whether it's uh, fintech or uh, cybersecurity or enterprise uh, IT. The type of uh, problems that we are facing with climate change is completely different. It's uh, typically uh, the solutions that humanity requires is uh, t typically with a tangible product. It's not only software. It's a much longer time to market. It's uh, much higher investments. It's much more, much more complicated uh, markets in terms of regulations. So the paradigm is really different. And if we approach it uh, with the current paradigm, we are bound to fail, and we need to change uh, the, the paradigm. Yeah. <coughs> now, to be honest, I think in the morning when we did the roundtable, uh, I came out like completely a change person looking at the climate, because the change in mindset is going to be the biggest challenge uh, in solving the climate using technology. So I'm right. glad that you actually laid that out. You know how it is going to play out uh, at the Israel. Uh, you know, where you are actually doing a lot of work in terms of the innovation at the Israeli Innovative Authority as CEO. Uh, so what are the works which you are doing which is going to change? How are you using technology to tackle some of the climate issues? Yes, um, for those of you in the audience that are not familiar with the Israeli Innovation Authority, we are the government agency in Israel who is responsible for uh, the Israeli government investments and policies uh, with regards to the Israeli high tech. We do direct investments of about uh, half a billion dollars every year in early stage high risk uh, uh, ventures. And we also develop the policies uh, for the entire government, uh, how to make sure that high tech uh, is really uh, growing to its uh, fullest uh, potential. So one of our principles is that we do not uh, decide on advance uh, in what to invest. Uh, we work on the basis of excellence. We get uh, thousands of requests uh, for investments every year. 
We run all of them through a very diligent uh, process of evaluating the, the level of uh, risk, the level of uh, disruptiveness of the innovation, the market potential, the quality of the team, and then we invest in the best ventures that we get. After the fact, we look at what we invested in and we see in which uh, sectors uh, we invested. Uh, since we are looking for such high risk, our profile of investment is very different from the private sector. For instance, uh, for many years now, we are not investing almost in uh, fintech or cyber or, or things like that because the private sector knows how That's to fund correct. it. Our uh, investments in the recent years are very much uh, leaning towards climate tech, health tech, deeper tech uh, solutions. This is where we invest. Yeah. So at this point of time, you know, let me expand my panel and invite. So we heard what the government is doing to really look at using technology to solve climate. Uh, let's look at what some of the large private sector players are doing. Uh, to tackle and look at uh, using technology to solve the climate. So with your permission, I would like to invite uh, two of our uh, panelists on stage. So first, I would like to invite uh, Hani Khalif. He is the Chief Technology Officer, Internet of Things and Digital Cities at Dell Technologies UAE. Welcome. And now, let me also invite uh, Sumantra Rai. He is the Vice President and Regional Head, Middle East, Africa, and Mediterranean at Tata Consultancy Services. Sumanta, let me continue with what he talked about, uh, you know, the green tech and uh, how we can use technology. So from your perspective, how do you think technology is going to play a big role in this whole carbon uh, neutral world? Right. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Nitin. So uh, let me split this into two parts, right? Part one is technology, which is core technology, science-based, physics-based core technology, and the other is the digital technology. So if you look at it, there are two parts to this entire uh, sustainability which is, stands out. One is the power, and the other is the water, right? Uh, and from a power perspective, there are three things. One is there are technical losses in power. Uh, then there are challenges in power that in the sense that it's not easy to store, right? And then the third is that you don't know how to integrate green power yet. The reason being today the wind may suddenly drop and or the wind may go up in speed and then you generate more power or rooftop retail consumers suddenly pump in a lot of uh, electricity into the grid. So the grid integrity becomes a big problem when you inject green uh, power, right? So technology is going to solve that very, very well. Uh, I'll get a little technical here, pardon me. Uh, for example, uh, there's a gentleman called uh, Professor Fudke in uh, University of North Carolina. Uh, he came up with an IoT stuff, which is called PMU, Phaser Measurement Unit. It's an IoT device which essentially, you know, all of us know who have been in science that, you know, car electricity goes sinusoidal, electric current. So it measures, measures the phase and is able to predict a second before if there's a grid collapse. That technology allows you to integrate green. Okay, I'm just giving an example. Yeah. Second, from a technical loss perspective, Today you have, uh, you know, you can go to a feeder level in distribution of power and say whether it, it is, is there a high technical loss or is it an okay technical loss, okay? And this, for example, uh, IIT Bombay did that for the city of Mumbai, taking into account daily temperature, humidity, whether it's, it's a festival like Diwali, even if there's a cricket match in, in India, the, the consumption of power goes up or down. Okay, so the, the, the geo uh, data points overlaid with social data points, they're able to predict better such that you're able to consume better because again, take, electricity is difficult to store. Coming to the storage, the last point I want to mention here is that it is, storing is actually very bad. Today, batteries are actually not green at all. So that's the third place I believe there'll be a lot of technology play to make 
viable green batteries. Green batteries are there. A lot of them are there, but it's still not viable and mainstream. So those are the technology things. The last piece, this is a bit in the future, is ultimate dream is that there is no loss of power when you, when you are going across miles of power supply. And that's superconductivity, right? Where you know, at lower temperature, uh, you are able to conduct electricity without any friction and any, any power. That's the dream of physicists. Uh, so far, it has been able to do it in minus 73 degrees centigrade uh, with nitrogen, liquid nitrogen. Uh, Indian Institute of Science said it could do it in ambient temperature, which is a great breakthrough. So, huge problem. I mean, it's not cost effective, but technology will, will make it greener. Yeah. So, one thing is very clear listening to the both gentlemen. Technology is the way forward. And uh, we also heard listening to your explanation, technology is not going to be that simple in terms of common men to really understand and go and create a startup the way we could actually do in other setup. So we require a different kind of a mindset uh, to be a technology player in the space of uh, climate tech. So now let me move to you, uh, sure. you know. Uh, so how do you think, given the complexities they talked about, how do you think organizations can use the power of technology to solve the digital and the climate problem? Sure, thank you. So I think you know, sustainability and climate now is a discussion that we're having with every customer almost on a daily basis. Sustainability now is becoming a core ask from our customers. Uh, we believe that for organizations to succeed, first thing is to have a very clear strategy on sustainability. Don't make it a side project, something for the PR, you know. And that's something actually at Dell we embraced a long time ago. It became a core value for us, sustainability and climate change and reducing our carbon footprint. So clear strategy is important. Then you need to communicate this strategy clearly, publicly, and to your team members and get them involved. In many of our campuses, what we did is we created a facilities sustainability council, which is team members from Dell, contributing ideas, because sometimes, you know, the brightest ideas might come from anywhere. And we don't want to limit it now just to management to decide on things. Uh, another thing that should, which I think organizations should start to do is for, kind of force sustainability agendas on their vendors. For example, and this is something that some uh, organizations are doing. For example, when there is a request for proposal uh, released in the market, they, show, they, they ask, show me what your sustainability goals are. Show me your achievement in sustainability, what you have done, what initiatives you have done, whether globally or on the local uh, level. Yeah, that, yeah. That's good, I thank you, because uh, now we have come to a stage where, you know, just like in FinTech, it can't be a side, it has to be a main theme of using technology to solve the climate uh, problem. Uh, Rod, if I can come to you, uh, you know, one of the challenges we also know is the ability of the policymakers to keep pace with the innovation. Mm. We have seen some struggle in uh, digital fintech space, but I think here we are talking about a completely different uh, ball game. So what is your view on how the policymakers have to step up? Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Nitin, and uh, sorry for uh, being a little bit pessimistic about this point, okay? <laughs> I think we see every year uh, the COP uh, meetings of the UN and we see that the progress of uh, policymakers is uh, not uh, that uh, fast, for sure not fast enough. Uh, and when you come to think about this gigantic problem of uh, climate change, uh, the only levers uh, humanity has uh, is either policy making, consumer habits uh, change, or technology. Policy makers are not moving fast enough, and given the, geopo the current geopolitical situation, I don't see them moving fast enough. Uh, consumer habits will not change. Uh, again, sorry for being pessimistic, but eventually all of us want uh, our houses to be warm. We want to use cars and planes to move from one, from one place to the other. We want to eat, uh, in most cases, meat and proteins uh, for our health. Uh, so consumer habits are not going to change. So I believe that the only thing that can really make breakthrough for us, uh, for humanity, is uh, disruptive technological innovation. Uh, in all the clusters that I've men mentioned before, whether it's transportation or uh, housing or industry or food and agriculture, everything that is emitting uh, gases, 
And here I think it's in the hands of uh, entrepreneurs and researchers, as you said to me, um, it's uh, something which is scientific based. It cannot be just a quick uh, application. So researchers, entrepreneurs, investors, all of them need to pay attention to this uh, magnitude of problems and uh, solve them. I can tell you that I, in every public event, I call upon Israeli entrepreneurs and investors to go in this direction. I believe uh, there is a great economical uh, potential there, as well as great benefit for uh, humanity to try and solve these uh, big uh, problems. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I think, you know, it is if the policy makers are unable to keep pace with the innovation, uh, it is always going to be a challenge because they are dealing with a very big unknown. They will yeah. come after the fact. Once the innovation will be there, they will find a way to adapt to the new technology. And some countries will be faster, some countries will be slower, but they, they have to see the innovation to adapt the regulation. We cannot expect them to prepare the regulation before they see the technological uh, development. Yeah, now that's a very good point. So uh, let me move to you from TCS perspective. Uh, he talked about that, you know, the companies have to make technology a mainstream uh, when they are looking at solving the climate and sustainability issue. At TCS, you guys have done a fantastic job in terms of making, using technology to go green. So can you share from your experience what TCS is doing, which other people can actually learn? Yeah. So uh, we have <laughs> promised to cut uh, green emission by 70% by 2025 and be net zero by 2030 as a company, stated objective. We're currently doing three things. One is with our infrastructure, which is making buildings, we have large buildings, as green as possible from ambient light to, uh, to recycling water to, to ensuring that the optimal temperature set in all ACs, etc., using technology and sensors to measure it. That's one. So, so infrastructure. Second is our ecosystem, right? So we, work, we try to work with people who are green. We are sourcing green power into our data centers within the, within the pieces. We are paying more for technology, and Honey will be happy to hear this, uh, which consume less power, uh, right? Uh, so that's the second thing that we are doing. And similarly, we are going out and giving solutions to our customers. For example, one of the largest <laughs> retailers here in, in, in UAE, in fact, the Middle East, they're given a solution where it will be, uh, you know, power usage in the retail outlets will be lowered. The third, and this is the most important piece, is with our employees. Uh, of course, there are simple things like rideshare apps which reduce the thing. But one piece that I really want to call out and talk about is that in our cafeteria, we have gamified food wastage. Okay? And it, it, it's poured out every day how much food you wasted. And imagine the rice you grow, okay? The amount of water rice takes is terrific. And then you waste it on a plate. You're doing a serious harm to green, right? So food wastage, we have taken it very, very seriously among. So, so our infrastructure, our ecosystem, and our employees. Those are the three broad things. Right. Yes. Thank you. Before I come to what Dell is doing, I think it's an idea from Manoj, basically to like, the, you know, the Google, uh, uh, Twitter has a blue tick. I think you can actually come up with a green tick to see how <laughs> sustainable and how carbon neutral each individual is. So that will be quite interesting for us to see. So now let's come to Dell. So what is Dell doing if you can uh, talk about using technology to solve the climate? Beautiful question, and uh, I will be here more optimistic because we are doing <laughs> our <has> part, <laughs> you know, uh, and I think ev each one of us will do his part, even as an individual, I will do it in my home. I think collectively we can create a change, you know. So at Dell Technologies, actually, we think of waste as a resource. So we convert everything that is waste into a resource, whether we recycle it and we reuse it in the products. <coughs> now, by 2030, just like TCS, we plan to do three things. First is uh, for every product that a customer buys, we plan to recycle or reuse an equivalent product. So one versus one. We're going to make 100% of our packaging recyclable. Okay, And then we will also uh, make half the uh, you know, ingredients of our products recyclable. For example, in screens and laptops. So that's in a product, you know, sustainability. We are also doing some global initiatives. For example, you know, when it comes to ocean-bound plastic, 
You know, there's 8 million tons of plastic that goes in the ocean. We are doing our part, you know, where we created initiatives to take this plastic, recycle it, and then we use it back in our laptops and screens. Some of Dell screens, which you might be using today, use 70% uh, recycled plastic. Okay? Many of the laptops that you use today use carbon fiber. We go to the aerospace manufacturers, we take the scrap carbon fiber, we mix it with plastic, and we create laptops which are, more, which are stronger and uh, lighter and also sexier because they look you know, really polished. So now this is for you know, consumer products. Now, in data centers where you know, every, every piece of technology around us is running on data centers today, so this, this meeting here is connected to the data center, social media, everything we do. We realized that this is a big uh, contributor to the carbon emissions globally. You know, actually, some estimates say that 3% of the carbon emissions are from data centers, which is the equivalent of the global airline industry. You know, airlines and data centers contribute as much you know, to the uh, uh, carbon emissions. What we did, we are making data centers more efficient. How? By using less cooling and less footprint, which means less efficient. So if you have visited us, for example, in Jitex, we were dem demonstrating something called immersive cooling, where you put the servers, the equipment, in a liquid, in a special liquid, which passes on the equipment, takes the heat out, and then dissipates it you know, outside. This uses maybe, tw yes. saves like 75% of the footprint and uses maybe up to 50% less cooling. So we're trying to do our part, you know, and like I said, each one of us will do it. You know, personally at home, I use the, you know, the special adapters on my water taps to use less water. Less water. I always ask my kids, open the water less, you know, consume less energy because, you know, I, I used to live in Canada. And uh, there's a nice definition of sustainability that I heard from McGill University that says, you know, sustainability is, you know, the ability to do, to meet our own needs without compromising the future generations to meet their own needs. And I like this definition because what we preserve today, you know, will continue to the next generation. Definitely. Now, I think it'll come back to what uh, you uh, talked about is change of the individual and consumer behavior is one thing which we need to look at. And the second thing, to summarize the conversation which we had, uh, the second thing we have to really look at what uh, India Global Forum can actually focus on, how do we define climate tech? What are the things which actually incorporate so that we are focusing on the right challenges and right problems rather than just keeping it uh, you know, too broad or too specific to that? And then we need to get the policymakers on board uh, so that we can fast track the innovation uh, and the implementation of that so that when we talk about climate to be the biggest crisis at this point of time, we need to prepare all the stakeholders at the same time so that we are able to move in tandem. So in the allocated 30 minutes time, this is what we could actually uh, you know, discuss. But I think it was a great discussion. Uh, we will continue the discussion backstage. And I uh, encourage all of you to reach out to these uh, gentlemen to continue the conversation afterwards when we break for coffee. But for now, thank you uh, all the gentlemen and thank you everybody in the audience. Thank you. Thank you. you.